farewell. Hail and farewell. It's the Marx Brothers Council Podcast. Episode 17, Hail and Farewell. Before we proceed with our discussion of the greatest film the Marx Brothers ever made for RKO, let's meet the cast. <laughs> In the role of Bob Gassell, the man known on official forms as Gassell, Bob, Bob Gassell. Hey everyone, and uh, thanks for the typecasting, uh, Noah. My, my career is over. <laughs> and in the role of Matthew Conium, he's the man whose name is an anagram for wet moth maniac and ethnic mama town, <laughs> Matthew Conium. I thought I kept that secret. <laughs> You're, the word is out. And I am Noah Diamond, and there's nothing you can do about it. I've had three of the best doctors in the East. <laughs> As many before us have determined, the question of whether Room Service is a Marx Brothers movie is a complicated one with no clear answer. In fact, while we may kick that question around a little bit, the possibility of a decisive ruling is so remote that maybe we should restrict ourselves to more solvable mysteries like... Does room service begin with an R? Or is it funnier to say jumping butterballs one, seven, or zero times? <laughs> we will get to all of that, but let's begin at the beginning with the genesis of this cinematic anomaly called room service. Bob, forgive me for not asking this in the original Hebrew, yeah. but why is this Marx Brothers film different from all other Marx Brothers films? Well, as most of us know, this was the only full-fledged Marx film that was not written specifically for them, not conceived specifically for them. They were basically shoehorned into a uh, pre-existing uh, script, a uh, uh, very uh, popular Broadway show. And, uh, you know, it was an experiment. Uh, the Marxes wanted to, to try this for reasons that we'll get into in a bit, and uh and it, it seemed like an interesting experiment after a day at the races. They were at a crossroads in their career. and They weren't sure exactly where they wanted to go. So they decided to, to give this a shot. And the whole RKO uh, experience and contract was perhaps going to send them in a whole different career direction. But when you see the film start and it says the Marx Brothers in room service, that's not absolutely correct. It should be room service with the Marx Brothers because uh, – that's what it is. It's it's you're seeing the show Room Service starring the Marx Brothers. You're not seeing a Marx Brothers film. You're seeing Room Service. Yeah, it's the first time the property itself is the star, rather than the stars. Room Service was mm -hmm. a very successful farce on Broadway uh, in 1937. Um, it opened on May 19th, 1937, a magical date in, in Marx Brothers history, and it ran until July 16th the next year. So it's more than a year, 500 performances, a big hit for its time. It was written by John Murray and Alan Boretz. I won't debate you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were going to say something. He had them there. <laughs> so the Marx Brothers, we find them at this moment in their careers. They've made the two Thalberg pictures at MGM, Opera and Races. And now they have this little detour at RKO. Uh, how did that come about, Matthew? Well, this was one of the th – probably of all the, the films that we researched when we were writing – the annotated Marx Brothers, this was probably the one that we had to clear away the most uh, dead wood from in front of to get to get to the, the truth. The the general understanding had always been that it was a loan out, that, that they were still uh, very much at MGM, but, but at a crossroads, as Bob said, because Thalberg had died and <clears throat> so on. Uh, and so they jumped at the chance to to take this offer from RKO as a loan out to do this this one off film. We now know that that's not what happened at all. Um, that they were on a kind of an option basis with with Thalberg. Um, they decisively left MGM. MGM were were quite pissed about it. Um, and they took up um, a, a contract at, at RKO for three films. So as far as they were concerned, they were decisively upping sticks and, and going to RKO. And the main reason um, seems to have been because they wanted to use this this moment in time to make a, a really bold, complete break to start doing something very, very different. So they they set up a, a three-film film deal with RKO. Room Service was going to be the first. 
and we'll come probably later on to why that was going to be so decisively different um of the i sing which was the film that they wanted to do when they briefly left paramount in the middle of duck soup was was uh, slated to be the second and then there was talk of them doing the three musketeers as well so the the whole idea was to to completely reinvent themselves um which for various reasons didn't happen and to clarify it was it was an option for three films it was one film and then I guess the studio had an option for more, or the Marxists did. Who, who uh, you know that? The studio, I presume, but uh, yeah. There was some poetic justice in this um, RKO contract for the Marx Brothers, because RKO was originally formed at the beginning of the sound era as basically a merger between David Sarnoff's Radio Corporation of America, or RCA, and EF Albee's Keith Orpheum theater chain. R RKO stands for Radio Keith Orpheum. And so the Marx Brothers getting this lucrative RKO contract is like the final punchline to Albie's blacklisting of the brothers from the Orpheum <laughs> circuit 15 years earlier, which was a key factor in their uh, career growth after the vaudeville period. Their uh, representation in securing them this excellent deal, was uh, also an anomaly in their career. This is the only time they ever got a job through an agent named Zeppo. <laughs> uh, in the Marx Brothers scrapbook, uh, Zeppo is characteristically unsentimental about all of that. He tells uh, Richard Anoboli, um, whatever kind of deal I would get them, they would want to change it and make it different. And Chico was always a little put out because he was the one who always wanted to make the deals for the boys. Mm -hmm. So the only deal I made was room service, and I found it so difficult, I didn't want any part of it. <laughs> he then goes on and boasts about the success of his manufacturing company. <laughs> and he says, uh, when he came into his own, he says, I was my own boss, and I told people what to do. I wasn't told what to do. And when they tried to tell me what to do, I told Gummo they were all his. I didn't want any part of it. That was that. <laughs> now, let me ask something here. Now, when Zeppo's uh, putting this deal together and he looks at this uh, script, do you think it all crossed his mind like, maybe this is a way I could get back into the act? If he was going to play Leo Davis, they certainly couldn't write him out. <laughs> you know, that was going to be a big part. If ever he was going to come back, this might have been the moment. Well, exactly. Yeah. So I yeah. think it's, it kind of proves that he didn't want to. I think that's kind of a bit more evidence that it never even crossed his mind. Do you think he would have been any good? He would have been all right. He's, he, yeah, he'd have been okay. I mean, I don't think Leo Davis is a is a good part for Zeppo. I mean, it is the young juvenile lead, so it's the part we would naturally think he would take if he had been part of the team. But um, Frank Albertson's performance of Leo Davis, which is very true to the page, is, you know, he's this kind of naive, middle American, uh, wide-eyed boy who comes to New York having written his first play. Um, I don't think Zeppo would have been even as convincing as he usually was. He's quite way. he's quite sappy, isn't he? Whereas Zeppo is zappy. Yeah. <laughs> Zeppo's a kind of a go-getting, you know, Zeppo zings, whereas... Uh, Zeppo does not seem like a kid from Oswego. No. You know? um, and so I think of all the male ingenues in Marx Brothers movies, this is the one that is least consistent with um, with the others. It's the one least like the roles Zeppo used to play. One small point to make about Zeppo's involvement is, um, as you as you so rightly said, what he what he's negotiated and secured were the Marx Brothers services for the project. One occasionally reads that he was he was kind of behind the whole thing itself, that it all came as one as one piece, and and it didn't. Um, RKO bought room service before there was any talk of the Marx Brothers being attached to it. And in fact, they they did announce um, a kind of a provisional cast. Uh, one was Burgess Meredith, one was Joe Penny. I think I can't remember who the other one was. But it was it was after they acquired the play at at, at a, a a great cost that uh, there started to be talk of the Marx Brothers being involved with it. It's interesting how the casting of the Marx Brothers is so defiant of the essence of this show. It's such a radical choice. Mm -hmm. And yet the rest of the casting is so traditional that it's largely the Broadway cast of Room Service. Mm -hmm. So in order to make this, vent, uh, this vehicle appropriate for the Marx Brothers, obviously some screenplay surgery had to be performed. And they brought in Maury Riskind. And it would be fascinating to know exactly what his directive was coming into this. 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in in interviews, he always says, you know, my job was just to turn the play into a Marx Brothers film, which was impossible. You know, I did my best, but it was basically just a straight adaptation. And it's actually not not true. He did do a draft um, that is that is very very marked up, and for some reason it, it wasn't used. Um, it's very very difficult to get the chronology right because in a minute we'll talk about how the Marxists themselves were going to perform in a very different way. So one would imagine that those screenplays would come in the opposite order. That he would have started off with a very traditional one because they were going to be playing yeah. it straight, well, you know, straight, right. but but not as the Marx Brothers. And then he marks it up. But it seems to have gone the other way around. Um, an awful lot of Groucho's dialogue in the in the earlier draft is is longer. It's the lines that we have in the film, but then in a, in a Groucho fashion, they they just go on for longer and kind of mm-hmm. spiral off into logical nonsense. But there are also some some lovely ideas um, for the opening night of the show. Uh, Chico goes out and hires what's described as what he describes as, as a huge man with terrific hands, called Professor Zeno, to applaud for money. Um, and there's also a lovely moment when Harpo is painting measles onto to Davis, as well as painting on the spots. He paints a battleship on his chest and signs it Faker England 1938. Uh, <laughs> and Gra- Groucho says, "If I thought that was an original, I'd buy it." So it's 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 very different. It's full of proper proper Marx jokes and for some reason um, that was reversed and what we have as we know is is a very very slight alteration of the original maybe this is what Riskin uh, wanted to do I'm not sure but what the film really needed is just a couple of times just stop the story and let the Marxists just be funny for a couple of minutes you know have a Groucho Chico scene whatever just you know RKO paid a lot of money for these characters and so why not use them uh I guess that's what they did with the uh, eating scene, but that's about it. He takes ideas further than the play, but they're still rooted in the play. So the eating scene is is obviously is a good example of that. Similarly, um, all the business with pulling Harpo's corpse about and leaving it in different places um, that doesn't happen. But it's but obviously it's an idea that comes from the scene. Um, there's talk of a, of um, Faker getting a turkey, uh, mm. but obviously he doesn't actually bring it into the room. So there are a few instances like mm. that. Well, as you indicate, Matthew, there was a lot of indecision about how Marxian this movie should be, both in terms of the screenplay and the performances. And it was not always um, a done deal that the Marx Brothers were even going to perform these roles in their usual personas. That's right, and this is one of one of the one of the great. If there was one bit of Marx history that I that I would like to be a fly on the wall and 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 find out more about, it's exactly what happened around March of 1938 that so completely changed their minds. Um, they were they were full of enthusiasm for room service, and there were lots of stories that they were going to be doing it, um, playing fair by the characters. Groucho was going to have a normal moustache, Harper was going to play a speaking role uh, and they were actually going to do a version of the play um suddenly that all changes and and it all changes um around march 1938 when they signed their deal with with mervyn Leroy to go back to mgm now what prompted that in terms of what was going on at rko i don't know but the effect it had on them was instant they just the, the the whole project went from a tremendously exciting thing to to this kind of millstone round their necks that they just wanted to get out of the way and 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 all the press suddenly turns against it and and you get these very snide comments in the trades about a film that hadn't even begun shooting yet um it's almost like they 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 deliberately pulled pulled the plug on it well there are a few comments here and there in the papers about they realized how risky it was to, to be le- leaving another character, you know, to leave yeah, the characters behind. But that was and, the and idea. How, how the audience would react. Not necessarily that they thought it was a bad idea, but they were wondering if the audience would buy it, if the audience would turn against them. And maybe that was part of the deal with MGM that they not do do this. Hmm. But they just, you know, they started off brave and they went timid. And I, and I don't I don't know what caused that that change. It may be that the return to MGM became clearer and clearer. And um, in press mentions of room service, um, you also find the earliest references to At the Circus, which apparently began as an idea to adapt 
Billy Rose's Jumbo. Um, so this too was going to be based on another piece of work. But it may be that at that point, they knew they were going back to MGM and, and back to their old thing pretty right. much. I think yeah. so, yeah. So this would have been yeah. not a new direction, but a single anomaly. So I think they sort of thought, why bother? And, and it and It was more of a career decision rather than what was right for the film decision. Yeah. And similarly, then, of course, we know that the um, the, the plans to do a, a, a touring stage version of it, as they'd done with the last two MGMs, were also dropped. And then instead, they did this very strange thing of uh, put, putting on scenes from it on, on, on the RKO uh, lot in front of um, invited audiences from all from all stratas of society, which was um, something that we, something that we were the first to publish, Bob. Bob very kindly attributed it to another author on an earlier podcast, but uh, we were first with that. <laughs> well, you know, there had been talk that they were going to go on tour, but nothing had been officially announced. And then they said, okay, there's not going to be a tour. They're going to do a couple of shows on the uh, RKO lot, which I still, it sort of boggles my mind to figure hmm. out exactly what they did. Was it maybe just a reading as opposed to a full fledged performance. I mean, I can't imagine them like yeah. going to rehearsals and learning learning this whole show to do three little test runs. Exactly. Yeah. Not only what they did, but but what use what use could it have been? Because obviously, with the with the previous two films, they were touring the you know the comedy scenes, the highlight comedy scenes, and perfecting them. But this is a this is a right. play script. So what what could they have got out of that? It, it's very strange. It's hard to imagine. It's also hard to imagine room service working at all in the form of anything but a complete production. I mean, a, a reading of room service, even just reading the play, which I think we've we've all done recently to prepare for this, you know, it is clearly a brilliant farce and mm -hmm. you can see how wonderful it would be on stage. Um, but the laughs aren't so much on paper. Uh, right. There are funny lines in it, but yeah. it's not that kind of humor. You really would have to fully stage it in order mm. to convey its its virtues and it would need some rehearsals and run-throughs and time on stage to really develop to really get a sense of how good it was going to be you couldn't do it right off the bat on the other hand if they had taken it on in earnest and cast themselves in the roles as written in the play this might have been the tour that made the most sense for them if they actually had toured in room service the full play um you know they might have earned the right to make the movie that way hmm Okay, I'm going to read part of an article from May of 1938, which uh, sheds a little light on what they intended with these performances. Um, As announced, the plan calls for three performances and audience reaction to determine which quips, jokes, routines, and general funny business are best liked. Guest tickets will be issued to persons in Glendale to test small town reaction, Hunting Park and Inglewood for America's industrial centers, Pasadena and Santa Barbara for the wealthy elite, Pomona and Westwood for high school and collegiate groups, Riverside for rural tees, Los Angeles for cosmopolitan tastes, and Hollywood for shrewd, critical, and theatrical reactions. Each audience of 100 persons is certain, the Marxist hope, to include the butcher, baker, banker, and candlestick maker. It is obvious that tickets for these unusual performances are at a premium. So, that's it. In Wheeling, they found out what coal miners thought of the show. <laughs> and they liked the idea of a miner hat with a... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That hat is anything but minor. <laughs> you know, the, the story of the making of the film is so interesting. And the interesting stuff basically ends the day they start shooting. They bragged about how quickly they did it, how smoothly, what, five, six weeks, whatever it was. Shoot yes, in thing. fact, yeah. Zeppo in the scrapbook says that I got them a quarter of a million dollars for five weeks of work. It's interesting when you when you go back and read the original play, um, not only uh, how many of the lines that seem like typical Marx Brothers lines are actually in there, like um, I can't get out of the wall or, you know, if you see one with onions, save it for me. He likes to hear the little bell ring. They're all in the play. But there are also some some very good funny lines that you would think would have made it over into the film, but but don't. Um, and two, a couple of my favorites, um, Chico's character uh, recalls about the time when he had um, a love affair with a lady doctor from Baltimore. And he says, she still sends me pills once in a while, <laughs> which is very nice. Um, does Ernst Lubitsch take his pants off? Wagner has a line where uh, uh, 
uh, Groucho, whatever he's called, Miller's attempts to explain why uh, people are in the bathroom taking their clothes off. Uh, he says it's an artistic temperament. It's uh, Chico's artistic temperament. Does Ernst Lubish take his pants off? Which would be very funny. But also there's a lovely uh, Chico line. Um, I caught a glimpse of a new art form, a stage without actors, a theater without an audience, just scenery and critics. Yes, it's reminiscent of Mark Twain's remark when he was appearing in a lecture appearance in Boston. He said, tomorrow night I appear before a Boston audience, 1,200 critics. Yes. <laughs> there, was a, there was an article I had read, and I wish I could find it, where Groucho basically says that they really like the idea of going into something that's a, a pre-made hit, that yeah. they maybe they're a bit tired of going on the road and spending a year putting together a film, that the idea of finding something that's funny and just acting in it really appeals to them yeah he said uh, if room service doesn't wreck our careers we're set for life and if it does all right we're going to use proven properties from now on no more anguish no more laugh tryouts you can understand why they would have found that easier but isn't it surprising that groucho of all people wouldn't see what seems so obvious to everyone else that the whole key to the marx brothers was their specialty material mm. and inserting them into other you know into standard comedies was not going to play to their strengths it's it's strange that that would be a blind spot for groucho marx of all people mm -hmm. but he had had this success in 20th century in in maine and one thing that i wonder about um maybe one of you has discovered this in your research but you know we know that it was at least briefly considered that in the movie version of room service groucho might have a real mustache and harpo might talk mm -hmm. Along with all that, was Chico going to play a non-Italian character? Was was Harry Binion going to be Binion rather than Benelli? I have to presume so. Yes, I mean it doesn't obviously that's not as as radical a difference. So it it didn't get kind of honed in on in the in in what press appeared. But but yes, I would imagine so. I was sort of picturing him doing some sort of other ethnic uh, character. Yeah. It's, it seems so arbitrary. I mean, we all know why Chico's character has to be Italian um, in room service, but but why? Why should Harry Binion, the theater director, become Harry Benelli? <laughs> and then, of course, no effort is made to make this character's Italianness important or mm. or convincing. It's just it's the in a way the flimsiest mm -hmm. chico we've ever seen obviously faker being mute as well you would you would think that would be uh, you know a, particularly in the 30s a drawback to a to a, a theatrical um, career but uh, <laughs> yeah. and and by the yeah. way why do we think he's called faker why why do we think he's called that yeah faker england i don't know why but for some reason i always took it to be like a childhood nickname referring to um sports prowess but but even saying that sounds ridiculous to me and i don't know why i used to think that but, but why on earth is he called <laughs> faker england i almost would make more sense to call him stuffy or yeah, rusty or rusty something. england yeah <laughs> <laughs> wacky england his he's completely i mean harpo has some wonderful moments in the film as he always does but there's almost no excuse for him being there and as hard as it is to believe that Chico is a theater director, uh, Harpo is not even given that much of an excuse. Um, one 1938 press item that I found um, says that, uh, incorrectly, in fact, that Chico plays Groucho's assistant in the film, and Harpo plays, as always, Chico's assistant. Hmm less than true but it's it shows that uh even after seeing this movie many people could not figure out what role harpo what had he was in doing that, yeah. uh well we certainly can mourn the room service that wasn't it would have been highly interesting uh to see the marx brothers attempt in earnest to just play these roles straight but that's not what happened and what we wound up with was a kind of hybrid it's sort of a Marx Brothers movie. Um, it's also sort of an adaptation of the Broadway comedy Room Service. Uh, it lands in the middle, and I would say doesn't quite satisfy the promise of either of those two things. I think what does come across is is a uh, is that that lack of enthusiasm that we mentioned earlier, or loss of enthusiasm rather. Um, there is a there is a feeling when you watch it that they are going through the motions, um, which is which is a shame when you think how buoyant they were initially um but when you look at the reports um of it being filmed they are incredibly 
do me. Um, Groucho had flu and Chico's mother-in-law died. And there was all, it's all this talk about them rehearsing behind locked doors in case somebody steals jokes. And, and it just, they just seem very, very pessimistic. Uh, Groucho, who, who admittedly always sounds pessimistic in, in these, on these occasions, but he was, uh, interviewed on the set and he said, uh, we'll be finished within five weeks. The time we used to take over one scene at MGM, but don't quote me. I have to go back there. Um, this, yeah. it's just a very <laughs> gloomy sounding production. And that does sort of, sort of come across, I think. Um, having said that, I, I watched it again today and I, I do have a very soft spot for it, for what it is. I'm going to be honest. I hadn't seen it in full in, I have no idea how many years. You know, I've seen little pieces here and there, and it it really, none of it works out of context. But it, I sat down with, like, the lowest of low expectations and actually enjoyed it quite a bit. You know, I, mean, I just, it was better than I remembered, and when you see it presented from beginning to end, you know, a lot of it works. It's it's grown up humor. It's yep. somewhat sophisticated, except for you know Harpo's bit. This I can't see how this would appeal for kids or small town folk, but for urban audiences, I think it's a nice grown up script. And yeah. if you go into it with the right frame of mind, knowing you're seeing room service and you're not seeing a Marx Brothers film, you'll enjoy it. I was surprised that I liked it as much as I did. I would say it's good fast. It builds. Uh, it reaches a good climax. Um, it centralizes them in a way that, uh, you know, it was going to be incredibly rare from this point on. Um, they're the main characters. It revolves around them. They're being, um, you know, rapscallions, um, incorrigible. And, um, yeah, it's not, it's not monkey business, but at the same time, I think it's, I think it's a good fast that, that, makes better use of them certainly than the next three MGMs. I agree. I think if they, if they had gone ahead with their original concept and made it clearer that there was no effort made here to make a Marx Brothers movie, right. then I think Marx Brothers fans would be more forgiving of the fact that they wound up not making one because the experience of watching the movie is not unpleasant. And, you know, and my notes from uh, my recent viewing, um, the last note in big letters at the bottom of my page is room service is not bad. It's good. It's just wrong. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think uh, to get to the crux of it, I think the, the main issue with it, I have, it's the very simple thing is that Groucho is in full makeup. Yeah. You know, I could, I could actually live with Harpo and Chico the way they're presented, but you, know, you look at Groucho with his grease paint mustache and that basically tells you, and it always has since day one that, don't take him seriously. Don't take the plot seriously. He's outside the reality of the show. And, you know, when you go to films, when you see a show, you want to see how people react and how they're, how they're going to deal with things. But when you're seeing a, a character that's obviously not meant to be taken seriously, you know, that happens from frame one. He's there with a waiter and you're thinking, oh, good. We're going to get a nice, like, uh, reprise of a night at the opera with the waiter. And, you know, you don't, you don't. It's all of a sudden he's, he's being very sincere. And there's moments during the film where he's very sincerely upset or concerned about something. And Groucho's performance is fine, but it just doesn't work behind that mustache. Yeah. If he looked the way he does in Copacabana, yeah. it, it all might work a lot better. Yeah. And, um, in the uh, New York Evening Post review of Room Service, uh, the reviewer Archer Winston says, to get the full comic effect of the producer's long line of predicaments, you must believe in him. Groucho's mustache and rolling eyes are footnotes in phoniness. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that although he, um, he you know, it does genuinely care about things and get involved in things, at least they're his own things, his own predicament, his own play, his own production. Uh, he's not, mm -hmm. he's not worried about, about Kenny Baker's circus or, uh, you know, helping, helping uh, young yeah. lovers. So, so in a way I, I take that point. I agree, but I still think uh, people who single this out for unique censure, um, I, I can't, I can't understand that because whatever's wrong with this, I still think is worse in, in the later MGMs. Um, he's just, he's just out for himself. He's just trying to get this play put on. Uh, he's willing to do pretty much anything in terms of, uh, you know, not paying his actors, stealing food, uh, you know, blackmailing to, to some extent, emotionally blackmailing at least his, his brother-in-law. Um, 
so so to me i think this is closer to an authentic groucho than you're going to get in in anything from here on even though he's he's saddled with this with this uh rather kind of heavyweight script groucho is the marx brother who fits the most comfortably into this kind of comedy um and and just the fact that we're dwelling on his makeup as the biggest problem in terms of making him believable in this role is a an indicator of that hmm you know, I mean, with with uh, Chico, for example, it's not like, well, if he'd worn a different hat, we, <laughs> <laughs> it might have been more convincing. And let's not forget the film was directed by William Cedar. Uh, yeah, a, a director of some note. And of some reputation as well. Did uh, Sons of the Desert. Right, excellent. You know, considering the material, which I'm not sure he had a lot of input into, I think he does a good job. Keeps hmm. it moving. He got the job in a slightly... Um left-handed way it was Through originally <laughs> <laughs> um when it was first announced uh in 37 gregory lacava was the director who was uh tagged to it um but the the name that you you see most often in in early reports is george stevens um and apparently mm. george stevens was taken off it um, and put onto Gunga Din because Howard Hawks was taken off Gunga Din because bringing up baby didn't do good business. So for that reason, um, there was a vacancy there and Sita was, was hired um, t- t- to fill the gap. Um, but yeah, he does. He certainly does do a good job. He keeps it moving, keeps it zipping along. And he did have a certain reputation. He um, he was brought in. Um, I'm, I'm working on a Abbott and Costello project at the moment, so forgive this Abbott and Costello uh, mention. But uh, Little Giant, which was a very kind of pivotal Abbott and Costello film, the first film where they played completely separate roles in the same film. He was uh, quite expensively brought in to, to direct that because he had a reputation for being a, a very very good and assured comedy director who can who can bring uh, potentially difficult projects into into line whatever the problems with room service are none of them seem to be the director's fault um he he seems to have done an excellent job but we might mention that had george stevens directed room service uh he would i think immediately have he would be remembered as the greatest director the marx brothers ever worked with Uh, some might say leo mccary but george stevens um was an academy award winner Mm. um uh, uh, really a great director he directed shane and giant that was his oscar uh with james dean Mm. uh also a place in the sun diary of anne frank very versatile director um uh who who did an awful lot i I wonder what it would have been like Mm. Well, Bob, you mentioned uh, the very first scene of the movie in which Groucho uh, interacts with this aspiring actor who is a waiter in the hotel, Sasha. If I can interrupt, let's let's go back further and yeah. uh, and talk about the opening credits because they're lovely, aren't they? Let's indeed. They're they're the nicest opening credits since Paramount, I think. Nice caricatures, yeah, nice music, nice cartoons. doors opening and closing, very nice. But once again, you're by all indications, you're getting a Marx Brothers film. Oh, yes, you know? yeah. but Name above the title, wacky characterizations. You're like, here we go. It's sort of a false advertising. Is this the first film that doesn't mention the Marx Brothers by their first names in the opening credits? Uh, yes, if it doesn't. Yeah, no, because there's no cast list, is there? No. Yeah. Because they're, they're the Marx uh, Brothers in Animal Crackers, aren't they? But it then goes on to have a, have a full cast list. So, yes. Yeah. But um, actually, that's a that's a very good point because the the British version of the film, which we'll go on to discuss the the significance of in a moment, um, doesn't have the end credit run. It just ends on the uh, RKO the end card. So in actual fact, that version never ever names them as anything but the Marx Brothers. The opening theme music is based on Mary Had a Little Lamb, or if you prefer, Merrily We Roll Along. Um, it is buoyant and pleasant, and uh, all of the music in Room Service is, other than this opening theme, I think, is diegetic music. In other words, mm. characters are actually singing in the scene. Um, other than that, no music, no harp or piano solos, um, no musical number, and many are surprised that the film does not include the famous title song, Room service wider than a mile. <laughs> uh, I think in this opening scene with uh, Alexander Azro, um, 
an actual Russian actor of the Stanislavsky school playing same. Uh, Groucho's Kazatsky is excellent, isn't yes. it? Yes. Uh, it's always a pleasure to watch Groucho. Yeah. I like him taking that bite out of that pretzel as well. He sees, he's, <laughs> yes. he's in good form. <laughs> <laughs> and again, if you go back to the original uh, Riskin script, there's much more uh, there's much more gibberish talk with him and the waiter. Um, perhaps, perhaps the oldest decision of all, I think, it was to was to to trim all that back out. Bearing in mind that they were now going to go to full full uh, Marx characterizations. On one recent viewing of Room Service, I watched it with the I was watching the uh, DVD release with the subtitles on because I was blasting my air conditioner in order to stay alive. <laughs> and I noticed that in the subtitles, uh, the line, uh, you know, a lot of actors would do anything to get as close to a lamb chop as you. And I do mean you. Um, that's an obvious Groucho-ism that's been added to it, but it's not in the subtitles. And I thought for a moment, oh, the subtitles are the original play. <laughs> <laughs> but- Seems like the subtitles were written by Horatio Jamison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you left out the main one, too. <laughs> Uh, and then we meet the character of Gribble, Joseph Gribble, uh, played by Clifford Dunstan. Uh, Dunstan uh, did not have very many film credits, but he appeared in 13 Broadway shows. Room Service was one of them. He was also in the original productions of Annie Get Your Gun and Pal Joey. Uh, I think, uh, like much of the supporting cast, he does a pretty good job. Was here. he Gribble in the play? He was, yeah. He he created Gribble hmm. on stage. Yeah, he's good. He's good fun. Uh, yeah. He does a good yeah. job. And when you first see him, you think he's going to be the antagonist, but he's not. He feels a little bit like uh, Whitmore yeah. and Day at the Races. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, he's actually a pretty sympathetic character, and he, he continually uh, puts his neck out for Groucho and company. No, he's fine. I would have loved to see him Louis Soren in there. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. She happens to be my sister. On my mother's side. Uh, one of those Groucho lines that I think would be a celebrated joke if yeah. it were in another movie. Mm. <laughs> and Gribble is Miller's brother-in-law. Uh, it always takes me a little by surprise anytime there's any reference to any of the Marx characters having family. They always seem such loners. But um, Gribble is married to Groucho's sister, so they clarify that, sort of. Sort of. I mean, I do think one of the weird things about room service is the Marx Brothers being brothers. It's hard not to think about that. In the other films, whether they're actually cast as brothers in the story or not, you're kind of aware of their status as a unit, that these three guys are family. Mm -hmm. Um, In room service, it still feels that way, but the plot really doesn't point you that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a little strange. I can't not think of them as related and as this kind of family unit. Um, and so the, the complications with Groucho um, being uh, the brother of Gribble's sister, uh, uh, no, being the brother of Gribble's wife, who we never meet or hear from at any point in the story, um, just sort of complicates the family tree. Flossie, she's more. called, isn't she? She's mentioned by name. Flossie? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then we meet Chico in the role of Harry Benelli. Uh, it's interesting to me to watch Chico in this movie. I'm not sure why, because if he's doing anything calculatedly different than usual with his performance, it's so subtle that it, it can barely even be mm-hmm. identified. And yet, in this movie, when I look at Chico, I feel like I can more than usual see Leonard Marx here, yeah. a man with very little hair in a wig and makeup, getting through it. I mean, one thing is you just you just get to see a lot more of him. It, it, you know, in terms of screen time and in terms of centrality to to the piece, he's yeah. he's there almost all the time, uh, which is mm. not you know particularly by this point not not what you would expect him uh, to be doing. He's interacting with everyone all the time. He's on screen virtually all the time. So it's it's quite a nice little yeah. showcase for him. Um, I do like his performance in this very much. I think he's very funny. Let's go back to his first line. Yes, sirree, it's a wonderful. I still think it's a terrible play, but it makes a wonderful rehearsal. 
Okay, now is this show supposed to be any good or not? They they sort of go yeah. back and forth. <laughs> That's the tricky thing, isn't it? Yeah, because we do get to see a bit of it, and it's dreadful. Uh, you win, that bloke who looks like Winston Churchill, and uh, this impoverished miner who kind of shames him into making some sort of uh, concession. Not sure what. Yeah. Um, they it, seem convinced that if they get to actually perform the show, that'll be a hit. But then Groucho's making jokes about the crowd going after Leo. Mm, mm. You know, and it is a hit, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is a smash hit. I mean, it, I, I think it would have been nice, as, I, as I've said in in my book, if if the in the finale they uh, in in chasing away from um, whatever he's called, what's he called? Wagner. Wagner, yeah. yes. Yeah. Sort of if they stormed yeah. the stage night at the opera style uh, and did a, <laughs> did a kind of a, a producers, you know, made a shambles of it, but that became a hit. Yes, that would have been a would have been a nice ending. Is it like this in the original show where they vacillate whether it's good or not? I think they must because. I mean, it's 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 odd, isn't it? Because they they've obviously selected that property to put on. Mm. Um, when you see a little bit of the show at the end of the movie, it it feels like a sort of half-hearted parody of a Broadway melodrama mm. of the time. But it doesn't quite go far enough to be that, and it leaves us wondering what's going on. Uh, in the original play, the title of the play within the play is not "Hail and Farewell," but "Godspeed." Obviously, you can't say Godspeed in a movie in 1938. Good heavens. Or maybe I should say Jumping Butterballs. And we'll we'll get to that when we get to uh, Donald McBride. Although you can say it in a movie in 1950, because it's, it's Godspeed in Step Lively. Oh, yeah. Mm. So so I'm not sure what's going on there. And what was the deal with this uh, this Nazi salute? <laughs> Oh, yeah. yes. Hail oh, and farewell, farewell, yes. And you do a kind of Heil. <laughs> Heil and farewell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chico, in his first scene, uh, mentions uh, the Hotel Metropole, which he calls the worst schlock house on 8th Avenue. The Metropole was a major gangland landmark, oh. or a gang landmark, if you prefer. It was home at various times to Nikki Arnstein, who later married Fanny Bryce. And Bat Masterson, who inspired Damon Runyon to create Sky Masterson. The Metropole in 1912 was the site of one of the most famous gangland murders in New York history, the gunning down of Herman Beansy Rosenthal. And it's mentioned in The Great Gatsby as a favorite haunt of Meyer Wolfsheim. The gangster character. Are you preparing yeah. a, a room service walking tour? <laughs> yeah, we're going to do the whole city, every room service landmark. Um, and if I were giving such a tour, I would mention that against all odds, the Hotel Metropole is still standing. Hmm. It's now called the Casablanca Hotel, named in honor of the Marx Brothers movie, <laughs> A Night in Casablanca. Imagine the letters that flew on that. One. Okay, never mind. <laughs> oh, just out of interest, is, uh, is the Hotel Edison any good? Because that's where we're staying. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, I love that's that a, place. It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's I a, know um, some of uh, Bullets Over Broadway was filmed there, wasn't it? Absolutely true. Mm -hmm. It's also right next to the former location of the 44th Street Theater where Animal Crackers uh, had its Broadway. We right? should clarify what we're talking about here. Yes. I don't know what we're talking Matthew about. Yes, I'm going to New York, York and we're going to stay at the Hotel Edison. So stay tuned, listeners. Uh, we are all going to, I mean, we haven't made our plans yet, but the fact that Matthew is coming to these shores, um, we are obviously going to have a big party in his room at the Edison. So uh, if, by all means, show up anytime. If it's unfortunate, I'll be in Israel at the, at the time. <laughs> Visiting Harpo's heart. Yeah. So, okay. So Harpo enters. Um, at this point, they are putting on all the clothes that they can so that they can exit the hotel wearing all of their belongings. Mm -hmm. Harpo enters in a collar and tie, but no shirt. Yes. Ready to help out. There's something about Harpo's appearance here that, that, that sort of rubs me the wrong way. His, his wig doesn't seem right. And he's wearing what seems to be wearing like some eye makeup. I, it, yeah. just, it doesn't seem right. I agree. Too much makeup. And his hat, rather than the usual tall top hat, is a shorter, more of a pork pie, right. a, a top mm. hat with pork pie dimensions. So he does get a top hat for a moment when he and Groucho oh, yes. switch hats yeah. uh, during their introduction to Davis. That's right. Which is a nice bit of business that, you know, you don't tend to see yeah. him do stuff like that so much around this time. He does a few nice things like that, I think, in mm. this one. It's uh, methodical, the way the Marx Brothers... Um, begin putting on all this clothing. It's sort of like, it would be a funny bit if anyone did it. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's done, you know, their acting is fine here. What their acting is indicating is we've done this hundreds of times before. We're following our usual routine. Mm -hmm. Something about Chico, um, I this is going back a little bit to what we were saying about his performance here. Maybe the fact that he does hang around on camera in this movie so much more than usual is one of the reasons he comes across as more of an actor. And it makes me wish he had dropped the accent. He almost feels like he could have been a Walter Matthau like right. performer. Oh. I'll tell you one thing that's different here is that Chico doesn't have any misunderstandings or uh, mispronunciations. Uh, he's usually good for at least a couple in each film. Yeah. So uh, we now get um, our first glimpse of Lucille Ball mm. as Christine. Uh, it's very early um, Lucille Ball, and yet uh, she was not green when she made this movie. It's it's a sort of pre-iconic Lucy, um, but she had already appeared in many films by this time. Lots of them were shorts. Mm -hmm. um, she is, of course, one of the bright comic lights of the 20th century. Uh, you wouldn't really know it from this performance. I, uh, I stand before you naked. But this, apart from a couple of clips from I Love Lucy, the Harpo episode, this is the only thing I have ever seen Lucille Ball in. Ever. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know how different she is. I don't know how good she is compared to... I've never, ever seen her in anything else. I'm in the decided minority opinion here, but in, in my opinion, I, I don't know that you're missing much. Mm. I think... I've I've never really been a big Lucy fan. She's obviously important and she's a pioneer and she was an inarguably skillful comic performer. Um, but I've never been able to fully appreciate her greatness, which I believe she must be great because so many people whose taste I respect feel that she was. For some reason, that's always been my instinctive guess, but I've I've never put it to the test. But you're right. It is a really nothing burger part here. You yeah. know, it could have been written. It could have been written out, and nobody would have noticed. That's right. Do you have any uh, um, ideas about Lucy, Bob? What are your general insights into this performer? Well, let me put it this way: I love her, and I love Lucy. I think all the accolades she's ever received for that are well deserved. She's a she's a wonderful comedian, a wonderful physical comedian. But to be honest, I I really don't care for her or anything else other than that. She played a very relatable character who had a kind of America's sweetheart quality about her. Um, and she certainly was important as a pioneering female um, creator and producer. Uh, but I always feel slightly irritated uh, when she's, she's often spoken about as though she were the only important female comedy star on television at the time, uh, when I would be quicker to blow horns for Imogene Coca yes. and Gracie Allen yeah. and... Audrey Meadows and others. Uh, anyway, she does fine in this film. <laughs> that, that, we'll, we'll end our I Love Lucy yeah. podcast here. Yeah. And, uh, but she, she appears uh, in the role of Christine and reveals that she has found a backer for the show, uh, affording us an opportunity to meet Frank Albertson as Leo Davis. Well, let's just go back to Lucy, to Christine. What? So Christine, she's an yeah. actress in the thing who also invested two hundred fifty dollars. I is think that a she's a, she's a, it's certainly in the play. It's made clear that she is Gordon Miller's girlfriend, isn't she? So she's actually Groucho's girlfriend. Yeah. Really? I didn't. Yeah. Even, that didn't hit me. Yeah, she's Groucho's hmm. girl. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, you didn't sense their chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she. but he does explicitly tell um, Davis that okay. Christine is playing the lead in, in his play. Hmm. Soon to be replaced by Zachary Fisk's girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Albertson um, is another, another guy who, you know, this is very early in his career, but he did go on to a, a long and storied career and appeared in lots of uh, well-known mm -hmm. Uh, movies and television shows, including uh, the films Psycho and uh, It's a Wonderful Life is, and Bye Bye Birdie. Yeah, we got two It's a Wonderful Life performers. That's right. Who's the other one? Uh, the, uh, the, the doctor, Dr. Glass. Oh, uh, right, right. It's an interesting performance from, from Frank Albertson because the, the performance he gives in Wonderful Life 
is much more what he's what he tends to be like in films. Mm. He he, uh, most often he's, he's cast, Sam Wainwright in uh, It's Wonderful. Yes, yeah, the guy that says hee haw all the time. Yeah. Um, he's most yeah. often cast as a very confident, <laughs> very pushy, um, slightly irritatingly, uh, you know, in your face type of type of character. So this um, this kind of hayseed role um, is quite unusual for him, and it, and it, he, mm -hmm. it, it does show that he you know he does have uh, quite a good range, I think. I think he's excellent in this role. I know he sometimes makes um, the lists maintained by Marx mm. Brothers fans of their least favorite male performers. Uh, I think he does this role quite nicely. Yeah. It's it, This is what the role is. He's supposed to be this almost, you know, Kenny Baker-like <laughs> innocent, uh, you know, sap who, who wanders into a situation that's over his head. Um, I think it's a fine performance. Mm, I do. Mm -hmm. Uh, he did not appear in the original Broadway production of Room Service. He is one of the cast members who's drafted for the movie uh, on Broadway. Uh, the role of Leo Davis was played by Eddie Albert. Hmm. And then we get another person who went on to become uh, even a bigger star, a Hollywood legend. Mm -hmm. In this film, she's 14 years old. Ann Miller. She turned 15 right, right before they started shooting. Oh, okay. She's 15. Yeah. I beg your pardon. Again, a, a person who later demonstrated great talent and even um, iconoclasm um, here in a, a fairly thankless role as a sweet young lady. Yes, it's one of the very few bits of the film, isn't it, where we don't get to see the Marx Brothers is their scene on a, on a park bench, which I believe Harpo is watching through a telescope, isn't he? So, it, so, so <laughs> yeah. in a sense, he's present, but uh, they have this... Mm -hmm. this basically disposable scene but it's i don't know it's quite nice isn't it they're sharing chocolates and I, I, I don't dislike it you wouldn't know it here but later on ann miller becomes a very idiosyncratic performer very distinctive way of speaking easy to impersonate um it, as recently as 1998 she was uh very well reviewed for her appearance in the Broadway revival of Sondheim's Follies, in which she sang the signature song, I'm Still Here. Uh, this was parodied in the review Forbidden Broadway as I'm Still Weird. Uh, <laughs> and that's how weird she was. Her delivery, she was almost a, a Marx brother, in fact, in her very distinctive and strange choices. Mm. Uh, but here we find her in an embryonic and indeed teenage mode. She's not weird yet when she made room service. <laughs> We get a little bit more with Gribble and we get to meet Mr. Wagner, the manager of the hotel or the owner of the hotel, mm -hmm. played by... Director of Services, the, uh, they gave him some weird title or something. And um, he's played by the uh, very mercurial Donald McBride. Who was in the play, wasn't he? I was... I was surprised yes, to yes, learn because yeah. he's, you know, I, I think of him as somebody who turns up in these sort of roles in films all the time. And he just feels like, mm -hmm. he just feels like film casting. Uh, but he was in mm -hmm. the play. Um, I suspect, judging by the tone of your question, I'm going to be the one in the minority. I think he's really good. I like him. I, I think he's quite good. I, I think he's a very good, uh, heavy character in this context. What I don't like and what for me kind of compromises um, the quality of his performance is the fact that while in the play, this character is constantly saying things like, God damn it. And damn it. Um, in the film, he five times is heard to exclaim, <laughs> Jumping butterballs! but that line is spoken seven times because Groucho and Gribble both get a crack <laughs> at it too. <laughs> this is one of those things everyone remembers because it's drummed into your head seven times in the mm. movie. Uh, but for me, it just gets less funny every I time. I think there was a product of the audience from Santa Barbara. Who, uh, who... <laughs> <laughs> their, their preview cards all said, yeah, that, say, <laughs> say that more often. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do like the way he says, um, bye, Godfrey. Yeah, yes. And which was a God damn it in the original play. You figure this out. God damn it. No. <laughs> bye, Godfrey. And it is kind of fun knowing that it is the same actor who had to relearn mm. his lines. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he commits. He's all in on this role. And I, I think he's quite good. Uh, but the jumping butterballs mm. thing is just... Uh, painful yeah i like his reactions as well he's he's very good when at the end when uh 
when Davis is apparently dying, you know, and Chico says all, all he said was mother, and, and, he's, and his, his sort of pained <laughs> reaction to that is very funny. And, you know, yeah. And uh, when, when Chico says uh, we could dump him in an alley, and he says, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's yeah. funny. He's apoplectic. <laughs> It would have been fun to see Groucho go up against him um, armed with his usual character and material. Yep. Yeah. Very true. Uh, Davis and, uh, and Hilda, or Hildy, um, they go off to see Sasha act, um, giving us a scene with uh, Wagner and Gribble in the room. And Chico enters with the head of a moose. <laughs> Jumping butterballs, guys. Uh, which you had trouble getting through the revolving door. Which, <laughs> which is a really good line, and a very typical comedy line that Chico delivers expertly mm-hmm. with no trace of dialect. <laughs> I also like it when he says that I ate him up to the neck. That's a lovely image. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a line, an interesting line here that's not in the original play in which Groucho says to Leo Davis, I am a great manager. A great manager never puts his own money into a play. This is, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. anticipates a very similar moment in the producers yep. the two cardinal rules of being a broadway producer a one never put your own money in the show and two never put your own money in the show <laughs> so just to clarify is there a difference between a manager and a producer oh well there is but i think for the purposes of this line perhaps not <laughs> yeah why why does groucho refer to himself as a manager at this moment Hmm. Generally, a manager would be more responsible for running the business yeah. of putting on the show. Um, I guess he's yeah, both, isn't That's he? a good he's, question. He's, he's, he fulfills both both functions here. So he's wearing his manager's yeah. hat, as it were, at that point. But uh, Yeah, he wears a lot of hats in addition to a lot of coats. And... <laughs> I, I want to see a rehearsal, though, don't you? I want to see Chico directing this play. Yeah. That's the... That's the biggest uh, <laughs> missing portion is watching Chico directing this play, I think. But they're taking this story too seriously for them to do anything too comic with it. Yeah, I mean, you could say Chico's characterization here is like, oh, they're trying to say this is an Italian theater director, you know, as with many Russian and French and so on. Directors who who came to the United States and found great success on Broadway and in Hollywood. But um, whatever convincing quality that idea might have had is blasted out of the water by the actual <laughs> performance Chico gives mm-hmm. and, and the way the part is written, mm-hmm. which really never asks us to accept him as a theater director. Mm-hmm. That's another interesting thing that the film doesn't do, though, isn't it? Is is open the play up very much. It does a little bit at the end, um, but you, basically um, it, it still it, it, it sticks to the to that one room set more or less for the whole time. Again, there were a few things um, that Riskin wrote that didn't get used. There's a night, there was a nice bit where um, reference is made to the, to the actors all sleeping in the ballroom. And uh, they said, what if, what if Wagner walks in? And Chico says, if, if Wagner walks in, they'll all start dancing. Um, Riskin did yeah. write a scene in which um, the cleaner goes into the ballroom first thing in the morning and is, is horrified to see it full of, full of people all dressed as minors, which would, <laughs> would, would have been a, you know, <laughs> A very nice little little mm-hmm. shot to break up the action with, but again, it it got scrapped. Yeah, I think this goes to one of the fundamental problems with the film, which would be a problem even if the Marx Brothers weren't in it, which is that farces, uh, like musicals, are very difficult to translate to film. Um, it can work. There are effective film farces, just like there are effective film musicals. But it's really an animal of the stage where looking at one set for the whole evening, the claustrophobia of that set, the use of entrances and exits from that set, and the precision timed going in and out of doors. I mean, when the Marx Brothers do this kind of thing in their own work, as in The Coconuts, you know, it's just a shot of the set because that's the way farces play well. You're just watching the clockwork Mm -hmm. of this um, almost engineering feat uh, play itself out. Uh, On film, because you have mobility and you have close-ups and all the vocabulary of the cinema, um, it's pretty hard to sustain that kind of um, farcical tone. It's strange, isn't it, that that element of claustrophobia that you you mentioned is 
something that is you, one particularly savors that in a play, whereas in a film yeah. it's constantly uh, criticised. People will say the film is too claustrophobic purely because film can go wider and 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 do those things. There is this sort of unspoken assumption that that it therefore should, um, which which certainly with with farce um, is problematic. I remember talking to. Uh, Ray Cooney, the the British uh, farce writer and director, and he said he found it very hard to adapt his his plays into films, which he has done several times. One of which, quite recently, uh, "Run for Your Wife" was was uh, voted the worst British film ever made. I think it it made about five hundred pounds or something on its on its run. Um, but uh, he wow. said, like it, it, in his plays, he likes to have uh, the end of the first act to be a really good you know, comic climax. And then for the start of act two to be right there still at that exact moment and carry on from there and to make it as tense and as claustrophobic as, as possible. But for some reason, stick a camera in front of that and people get itchy. I don't know why really. Well, if the idea is simply to preserve a theatrical performance. I mean, we of course talk about coconuts and animal crackers on film as, yeah, just point the camera at them and let them put on the show. That's what we want to see. Um, but in this case, we're not as hung up on an accurate record of the stage version of Room Service. And if we were, we wouldn't want the Marx Brothers to be in it at all. Um, therefore, yeah, if, if we're accepting that this thing is a film, it, it does sort of fall apart. This is a film about a play, but we almost never see any of the play. Um, it's kind of tacked on at the end. Mm -hmm. Whereas on stage, we would never question that. But in the film, it's a little strange when it's opening night and they're all saying like, well, the curtain goes up in 20 minutes. <laughs> but we're not going to see that. You know, we're stuck in the hotel room with these guys. Yes. <laughs> Well, what we wind up with in the story is the promise by Mr. Jenkins of a $15,000 check, mm -hmm. immediately followed by the promise by Mr. Wagner that if they don't pay their $1,200 hotel bill, they have to leave immediately. So it now becomes about trying to stay in the room. Maury Riskind gives Groucho a line here. Um, they're, they decide they're going to sleep in shifts, and Chico volunteers to take the night shift. Groucho says, you take the night shift and I'll take the day shift and I'll be in Scotland to party. <laughs> uh, reference to the Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond. Um, you'll take the high road and I'll take the low road and I'll be in Scotland before you. Uh, it stands out to me as a quintessential Groucho line, a great sort of opaque reference. And another one of these lines that if it were in a Marx Brothers movie, I mm. think it would be a celebrated line. <laughs> it's, a, it's a companion piece to you go Uruguay and I'll go mine, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So was this Jenkins the same actor from the Broadway show? Uh, oh, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, Philip Wood plays uh, Simon Jenkins, and he did create the role on Broadway. I like it when he gets goosed by the moose head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. We don't yet uh, know his secret that he represents Zachary Fisk, but we know he represents um, Zachary a Fisk. private and nervous and wealthy and famous man. <laughs> Um, so then we get the measles ploy mm -hmm. to uh, disguise uh, Leo Davis as a measles patient. Harpo blows some, I guess, iodine on his face um, mm. or some kind of dark material yeah. to give uh, to give him spots. Mm -hmm. If it had been iodine, I guess that would have been dangerous and painful. But uh, that is what it looks like. <laughs> um, so uh, he Davis gets into bed and, and plays sick. Um, this, this plays fairly well, but it's really set up for Harpo to play sick later. Groucho has a phone call here where he impersonates Dr. Glass in an effort to order some food <laughs> for all these hungry characters. Hello? This is Dr. Glass. Uh, Glass, the house physician. The patient in room 920 is very ill. He must have food immediately. He's just developed a tapeworm. And when Groucho um, makes this call, his characterization as Dr. Glass, on first listen, it seems so uninspired compared to his brilliant Colonel Hawkins uh, one movie ago in A Day at the Races. But that's because we have not yet met Charles Halton, who plays Dr. Glass in this movie. And when we do meet him later, we realize Groucho is actually doing quite a credible <laughs> impression of Charles Halston as Dr. Glass. I'm not a dick. I'm a doctor. 
Dr. Glass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could have been a great line from McCoy in Star Trek. I was just thinking, yeah, it sounds like a, a Dr. McCoy. <laughs> Um, they they convince Sasha, the waiter, to bring them a meal. He has a line I like where he says, gentlemen, you are singing music in my ears. Um, and then, yeah, Timothy Hogarth is the character from the We Never Sleep collection agency. <laughs> and he's um, the one that was someone else in this, the play, isn't he? Philip Loeb. He was the Harry Binion. He was Chico's Yes, Chico's that's right. He was, he was Chico, yes. Yeah. 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 Philip Loeb, yeah, he was the original Harry Binion, and he was sort of brought in to take this supporting role. Oh, and he's, he the, he's the one that directed some bits. He was like production advisor as well. And, yeah, and, yeah. Yes, yeah. And directed some scenes, I believe. He had a, a record as a director. He, um, he appeared in dozens of Broadway shows um, from the teens to the 50s, and he also directed a bunch of Broadway shows, including several editions mm. of the Garrick Gaieties. Mm. Um, he was very prominent on Broadway in the 20s when the Marx Brothers were having their Broadway years. And I haven't found any specific crossover, but he certainly would have been aware of them. And, and maybe he knew them then. Mm -hmm. Later in his career, mm -hmm. Philip Loeb is blacklisted under McCarthyism. He's listed in red channels mm -hmm. and he commits suicide tragically in 1955. And he had been a regular on the radio and TV version of the original show, The, the Goldbergs, which was yeah. very big. And he actually got replaced, he got kicked off the show by the blacklist. And yeah. And and he became the one of the inspirations uh, for the character Hecky Brown, played by Zero Mostel mm -hmm. in The Front. Yeah. Uh, Zero Mostel and the screenwriter of The Front, Walter Bernstein, were both friends of Loeb's. And uh, they based that character partly on him, a desperate comedian who's career and life are ruined by the blacklist and and who kills himself and he does have a nice creepy uh, presence in this film <laughs> it, it, it is a, a very strange character there's a lot going on with him under the surface uh, i think he's an interesting figure um well after we meet uh philip Loeb, we meet a turkey ah. Ah. Hmm. it's another one of those things like jumping butterballs everyone remembers this mm. because it's big and brash and broad and memorable Personally, I, I don't. I'm not wild about no. this. It seems so distasteful to me. But when he when Harpo first comes in and pulls it out from his jacket, it's a real life turkey, and it's it's mm. it's, it's going nuts on Harpo there. You know, he holds it, yeah. it by one wing. I'm sure you know. Horrible, yeah, yeah, it's really slapping him. I, you know, they they kept the shot going as long as they could, but you could tell mm. Harpo was in some distress there. Mm. And then after that, yeah. it's a yeah. fake turkey. The rest of the rest of the yeah, it's a it's a yeah. silly scene. I lo I love that British review of it. Um, th th there's there's a scene in which a turkey is chased around a room. Not everybody will care for this. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think that's about right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah truer words were never written. <laughs> I mean, in addition to the kind of you know a animal cruelty of mm -hmm. it, um, what exactly? would these four men in this hotel room do to convert this mm. live turkey into a meal? It's just Harpo had a hot plate. Harpo had a hot plate when he brought over his stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and a live turkey and a hot plate is all you need to eat in a New York City hotel room. Well, the turkey flies out the window, thankfully, and, um, and then Sasha appears with an actual meal for them, and maybe the comedic, or at least the Marx Brothers, highlight mm. of this movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, early in the eating scene, there's a continuity error with oh. Sasha's hair. I, uh, I, I mention it because I never notice this stuff. I'm never the one to catch stuff like this. But yeah, in one shot as he's serving, Sasha's hair is falling in front of his face, and then it cuts to a close up, and it's all neatly plastered. Oh yeah, backward. yes. He had a Shemp Howard thing going there for a bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The bit where he jumps in shock is Groucho squeezing his balls. I can't think of anything else he could be doing. <laughs> with butter apparently <laughs> <laughs> everyone listening to this put it yeah. put it on pause go and go and dig your yeah. dvd out watch this scene tell me if you think groucho squeezes the waiter's balls <laughs> <laughs> and don't get testy <laughs> uh well what do you guys think of the eating scene I think it's great. I think it's really funny. I like, it's like um, it's like in the, the one in Night at the Opera, but not as gross because he doesn't put stuff on his face. Mm. Uh, it's very funny. <laughs> but the the very last things that Harpo is eating, I don't know what they are. They're little cubes. I think they're little potatoes. Ah, 
Whatever it is, it's diced. Diced potatoes. But okay. um, Nick Santa Maria mentioned this a uh, month or two back on, on the board that after this big meal that they've had procured, Harpo sits back and pulls a banana out of his pocket and starts eating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then finishes and pulls out another one. Yeah. It's a lot like breaking out of uh, jail in the coconuts. Uh, yeah. yeah. After all the production to, to get him out. Yeah, it's true. I, I, it is a, this is a happy scene and it's so clearly the Marx Brothers performing comedy that was created for them, um, in a very well rehearsed clockwork sort of way. Um, but I can't help noticing that although the whole thrust of the scene is that they're consuming a tremendous amount of food at a relentless pace, there rarely seems to be much food on that table. Yeah. Uh, it's just a banquet. <laughs> and I'm like, well, where's the food? I didn't, I didn't see any. They're really eating as little as possible on what I imagine was their 25th <laughs> yeah. take or it something. It like one guy's breakfast that they... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at, at the end of the scene, when you see a shot of all the empty dishes, the table looks fuller than it has at any point mm -hmm. up to them. <laughs> Um, nevertheless, it's a good scene and it's a welcome scene in this movie. Mm -hmm. Christine shows up with the contract, Wagner and with Gribble mustard, return, and now it's Harpo's turn with mustard on the contract. Yes, all all, all Broadway contracts. Now, what I, I had an issue here with this corned beef sandwich. You pulls it out; it's on white bread. <laughs> I'm like, what, the, what is this, Annie Hall? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. There is nowhere in the Times Square area where you could get a corned beef sandwich on white bread. <laughs> but we do then get, uh, while Harpo is playing sick, Chico dropping little pieces of white bread, I suppose, into Harpo's mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, why is, I mean, it's hilarious. Why is that the way you care for this allegedly sick man? <laughs> Break tiny pieces of bread and drop them in his mouth from three feet above his head. <laughs> Chico does this kind of lovingly. It's actually mm. beautiful, but Very sweet, I don't know yeah. why. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we meet the real Dr. Gloss, right. who examines Harpo. Um, and he was the bank examiner in It's a Wonderful Life, Charles, Charles Hall. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he went from being a bank examiner to being a Marx examiner. Mm -hmm. And he's about he's about to undergo the most extreme vault fast of any character in any film ever, <laughs> when he turns from uh, yes. somebody who loathes Miller into his staunch defender. <laughs> after they've locked him in the bathroom, yeah, <laughs> yeah. After they've completely humiliated and, and inconvenienced him, he becomes their cheerleader. <laughs> yeah, Doctor Ex Machina, I think, is his real name. Um, Wagner learns that 19 people are living in the ballroom. Jenkins brings the check and reveals Zachary Fisk as the writer of this check. Mm -hmm. uh, and then right on schedule, Wagner returns to uh, kick Groucho out of the room. And now everything gets crazy. We get a big scene that could possibly be described as farcical uh, with Wagner and Gribble and Dr. Glass is bound in the bathroom and he makes this surprise appearance. We get a Another appearance from the turkey, which apparently has flown back into the window for another uh, tryst with Harpo. What? So turkeys can fly? I just want to clarify this because I watched WKRP and it didn't go like that. As God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. This turkey does seem to have flown from a pretty high window in a Manhattan hotel and then flown back in considerably later so it was flying around this whole mm -hmm. time uh, unless it was just on the fire escape or something like that <laughs> um dr glass um outs zachary fisk to wagner this causes all the characters to turn on wagner you know you fool how could you do this now it's gribble's turn to say jumping fireball uh here groucho uh refers now that Wagner is humbled and is now trying to uh, endear himself to them and get them to stay in the hotel, um, Groucho starts um, uh, angling for an upgrade in the hotel room, and he asks to be released from this frowsy little dungeon. Uh, the word frowsy does not appear in the original play, and it seems clearly to be a Maury Riskind uh, interpolation, frowsy being a, a Groucho-associated word, because in Animal Crackers he pronounces... Rittenhouse Manor, one of the frowsiest looking joints I've ever seen. Yes, yes, yes. Would you like to know a little bit about the word frowsy? I would. The word frowsy, meaning musty, uh, having a slovenly or uncared for appearance, stale. Um, 
This word is perhaps 330 years old. Mm. Its earliest known appearance in print is from the English playwright Thomas Otway, <laughs> who in the play The Soldier's Fortune in 1681 refers to a character as a frowsy fellmonger, <laughs> a fellmonger being a dealer in hides or skins. So Frowsy, that would have been a good name for Harpo's character, Frowsy. Frowsy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it really would have. <laughs> It's a wonderful word. If somebody called me a frowsy fellmonger, I would, I'd be quickly humbled. Um, it is suggested uh, that the actual origins of this word are unknown, but there may be some connection with uh, the chiefly British word frosty. Perhaps you can help me with this, Matthew. F r o w s t y. Is this known to you? Frosty? No, I don't know that at all. We say frosty, yeah. meaning. Um, uh, s smelling a bit uh, musty, moldy, but I don't know frowsty. Uh, the snowman? So a, a similar meaning. Yeah, it sounds to me like a, a soulful reading of frowsty the snowman. <laughs> <laughs> but we're getting off track here a bit. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about frowsy more in our frowsy episode later. Um, so Davis arrives with the news that Jenkins is going to stop payment on the check. And Groucho discovers that he didn't sign the contract, which takes us to what in the original play is the act break before act three. And it is now Groucho's turn to say, Relax, Davis. Wagner is backing the play. Jumping butterballs! Please, everybody, stop saying it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> um, all right. Act three begins with a shot of the marquee of the fictional White Way Theater. Mm. Um, so we're we're out of the hotel room anyway, and it's it's much more much more uh, prestigious looking than we were led to to think, weren't we? And it, and it also has Gordon Miller's name above the title, I yeah. believe, indicating that that it his is a name to conjure with somehow. And this theater is connected to the hotel, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Miller says to Wagner, "Your theater has been sitting empty, or right?" Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, not uncommon for a hotel to have a theater in it, but um, it is a little, it is left rather ambiguous for most of this film. And yeah, we're led to believe that this is all kind of a, a fairly meager uh, shoestring operation. But as soon as we see that marquee, uh, we realize, as you suggest, Matthew, uh, this is a big Broadway show. Gordon Miller is a, a name to be reckoned with. And people have turned up for it, haven't they? Yeah. Lots, of, yeah. lots of very smartly dressed people are, yeah. uh, are pouring in. Although it doesn't really make sense that the hotel would be connected to the theater, because then you would think the hotel would do everything in their power to make sure the show goes on. Yeah. Hmm. Even if they had to give a few free rooms out to the yeah, to the, yeah. the people involved. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fairly common trope in backstage stories in in Hollywood movies and and also in plays that um, there's often just a theater sitting there empty, waiting for the protagonists to come and put on a show and have a big success. <laughs> Rarely the case. Uh, rarely the way uh, securing a theater for a production actually works. <laughs> hey, this one's empty. We'll do our show there. Did I did I hear a bit of bitter experience there? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite possible. <laughs> but yeah, there's there it is. Um, I, I um, this is a bit of a detour. But in the Woody Allen movie Manhattan Murder Mystery, Alan Alda plays a playwright, and there's a, a scene where they need to use a theater for um, a plot development and and woody allen says to alan alda uh you're a playwright your theater is always empty we'll use that uh which much as i love that movie too boy does that strain credulity because he's a playwright he of course owns a new york theater and it is of course empty because they need one um, anyway, one of the smartly dressed uh, celebrants of the opening of Hail and Farewell is Mr. Wagner himself, who enters in jolly spirits with a celebratory wreath that has a big ribbon that says success on it. That came from a day at the races, right? There was a leftover. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The RKO borrowed it from uh, MGM. Mm. Uh, and then Wagner gets a phone call and has a tantrum realizes what's been going on, that Groucho signed the check, which has bounced. Um, Groucho sings, I'm headed for the last roundup here. I'm headed for the last roundup. Get along, get along, get along, get along. I 
think you point out in the annotated, Matthew, that um, MGM's publicity department would rather lamely refer to the same song in their materials for Go West, declaring the Marx Brothers headed for the last clown up. Yes, the fast clown up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is incredibly awful. <laughs> Yes, uh, if if I might quote you, Matthew, I think you express some surprise that someone was paid actual money for writing that line. <laughs> <laughs> so we get a big scene where uh, a big sad scene where everyone is sad. Mm-hmm. Um, they're noting that the play is about to begin. Um, Davis tries to leave, but is thrown back into the room by the hotel dicks, <laughs> who then throw Harpo into the room. Harpo is wearing a cape and a thing on his head that confused me so much when I was a child. Yes. I now uh, understand this to be a carbide cap that a miner would wear. We see them briefly in the play itself later. Yeah, I mean, we think of miners with those lamps on their helmets operated by a battery. This is the earlier version, a gas lamp attached to a hat that miners would wear. But like you, I thought it was just a funny hat that Harpo yeah. had. Yeah. When I first saw it, I thought it's, he just had this, this yeah. funny hat with with a, with a flame on the front. And even when he's supposed to be dead, they didn't ever even think of putting it out. They just let it flame. <laughs> no, I know it. And when they decide to start a fire to try to um, get uh, out of the room, uh, they, they decide to start a fire. And it's like, oh, well, fortunately enough, Harpo's hat is already on fire. So we can just <laughs> we can use that to start a fire. Um, the cape is nice. I like Harpo in a cape underlines his super heroic quality. Uh, the Sweet Adeline reference is nice. Well, the quartet is complete. What do we do now? Sing Sweet Adeline? Makes us feel uh, like some continuity with, uh, with monkey business. Um, as you noted earlier, Matthew, this scene in which Davis has to pretend to die for a couple of hours while they wait for the play to finish, uh, it does give uh, Donald McBride as, as Wagner some of his best acting moments um, in which he he desperately wants and even legally needs to notify the police because he thinks someone has died. But uh, Groucho and Chico keep imploring him to be respectful of the, the sacred mm-hmm. moment. And he does in a very endearing way, sort of go along with them. Don't use the phone. He used it, you <laughs> yes, know, just recently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we might have uh, mentioned this earlier, but uh, is it true that McBride is an extra in Animal Crackers? Yeah. It is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he, he's there in the when um, Spalding turns up. He's very, he's very much, uh, you know, doing a lot of gesturing and, and looking at the other actors. Also in this scene, there's a lovely Harpo stuff when they're making the epic act. Um, that a lovely bit where he chinks glasses with McBride. Um, <laughs> Harpo's going off and secretly drinking it himself, and then he comes back with another one and he chinks the glass. Very, very nice Harpo yes. moment, as good as any. Right from beginning, he begins in a kind of sneaky way, and That's then he right, just goes, yeah. graduates to open defiance. <laughs> um, and then they sing "Swing Low, Sweet Chariot," or or do they? Yes, Matthew, will you uh, put on your carbide gas lamp hat and illuminate <laughs> our way here? I will. Yeah, I mean it's difficult because I've because this is a mystery with with so many potential solutions, all of which are wrong. It's difficult to know how to start. I mean, I suppose I should start by saying that when I first got the DVD of Room Service, I was idly watching it and then was brought up brought up short uh, by hearing something that I'd never heard before, which was Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Swing Low, Sweet Chariot Come and for to carry me home so everybody who's listening to this now, or most people who are listening to this now, are thinking, what's unusual about that? And the answer is, I'd never heard that before, because what I'd seen on British television and what I had on a British VHS was a different version with a different song, uh, both when they're singing it over his body and then again at the end when it's it, it's sung set to music. They're not singing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, but what they're singing is what I hadn't realized until I heard Swing Low is actually a pastiche of it. It's a song called One Last Sweet Cheerio. So the the film, the visual is the same. The sound is overdubbed. Ah. So for that reason, um, 
the the lines have to fit the the duration and as much as possible the mouth movements so it's actually an incredibly skilled pastiche one last sweet cheerio to my friend they're calling back home does it sound like the same voices it is it is unquestionably the same voices it is them um which is particularly obvious in the you know in the first bit where there's no music mm -hmm. What I first thought was that what I was suddenly seeing on DVD was an early version, was a was um, a kind of a a rare pre-release print, and for some reason they changed the song. What I very quickly realised is this is not the case. That was the version that that all of America saw, and that the version I had for some reason was done at enormous expense, presumably with a full orchestra and rehiring the Marx Brothers purely for British territories. Now, I don't know why this should be, and I've asked everyone over the years why they think that might be. Um, we've come up with about four possible explanations, none of which I think are good enough. Ironically, the best one is the one that's easiest to disprove, which is that um, there was some problem, some copyright problem with using Swing Low, and they had to change it for that reason. Um, obviously, that can't be the case because it's not a copyrighted song. It's a very, very old traditional song. So that 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 cannot be true. Uh, somebody suggested it might have been changed uh, that it, rather than a British version. It might have been a version that was made for Southern American territories because of the song status as a Negro spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't think that could be the case either, not least because uh, Groucho's <laughs> interjections of Yaman and show enough are still there. <laughs> but but again, you know, I, I, I don't think, you know, I think it was a traditionally well-known enough song in all contexts mm. to not be perceived that way. Somebody suggested that maybe the song Swing Low Sweet Chariot wasn't known to British audiences. Well, okay but so what certainly this brand new song wasn't either and uh, american films are full of stuff that that we didn't we didn't understand mm -hmm. um so so ultimately i i cannot tell you why it is uh there is just this strange alternative version which is the version that we saw all the time on television here it's on all our vhs releases and it was only on dvd that we got the chance to see this 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 different version which is the authentic american version hmm. um the irony is that i i greatly prefer the new song although it is made um you know as a technical exercise it's a really lovely little song with a lovely tune and i just think it rounds off the film so much more nicely every time i watch it like again today i put the dvd on uh and i felt like you know i i it was missing something at the end mm. um but if anybody listening has any more information on why that was done uh do please let us know because it's probably the most apart from the identity of the manicurist it is the most enduring marx mystery of all for me <laughs> <laughs> thank you for clarifying that yeah <laughs> <laughs> this is very lame as a theory and i i can't even i can't commit to it myself but the only thing i've ever been able to think of um I was introduced to this through your book, Matthew. I wasn't aware of the sweet curio version uh, before. But I wonder if maybe there's some chance that Swing Low Sweet Chariot had been prominently featured in another movie around the same time. And maybe they felt like including it in this one was somehow overlapping too much or confusing funny enough or... that is actually true um because just today i thought i thought i'll have one more fruitless search through the the online archives and i just put in marx brothers swing low and i did get about a dozen hits from 1937 of adjacent but unconnected stories one involving the marx brothers the other one involving a 1937 film called uh swing low not sweet chariot swing low swing high i think swing low swing high um so again why that would prompt them to 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 go to the expense of recording this new version i don't know but but you are correct that is it that is the case so if you think that might be a reason that might be a reason yeah it's a great mystery uh, but mm. it is um at any rate uh what a delightful outcome that we actually do have a recording of the Marx Brothers singing an artificial 19th century spiritual. Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, someone as well pointed out that the very word cheerio um, is quintessentially British, um, that America's only yes. kind of contact really with the word cheerio is, is the cereal. And this film predates that cereal anyway. So cheerio is only a, a British expression. So it, it does seem that it was made for Britain, a British version. But why? I cannot imagine. Oh, you can imagine, but you just don't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, shortly after our f the, the film's first rendition of that song, whatever it might be, um, we get the pleasure of Harpo Marx faking a suicide. <laughs> um, he <laughs> enters that carbide hat still flaming, um, and he has a knife in his chest along with a note. Um, this note, I have come to consider this note very funny. Um, and that's because of you, Matthew. Um, you've quoted this line an awful lot. I believe it's a heading on your blog. It is, yes. Wagner drove me to my death, just as he drove Leo Davis. <laughs> Out of context, that's a really funny line. It's also just funny, Harpo. Harpo as like the least literary, the, the least literarily inclined of all these characters, having, before killing himself, written out a careful note that says in the past tense, <laughs> Wagner drove me to my death just as he drove Leo Davis. Yeah. That's I don't, funny. And he has nice handwriting too now. <laughs> well, well, I don't intend ever killing myself, but if I did, I, I hope I would have the presence of mind to write that as a note. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything specific, Matthew, that caused you to pluck that line and, and celebrate it the way you have? <laughs> not really. No, not that I can. Well, <laughs> maybe maybe not that's not that's fit for public consumption. But uh... Uh, well, after uh, that suicide note, um, we get a an actual outdoor scene in an alleyway, mm. um, which is quite nice. A little evocation of the New York streets. Um, Harpo, uh, still with this flaming miner's yeah. hat, um, is, is taken out into the alley. Um, they encounter a cop who says the show is going great. <laughs> it's going so great that the cops on the street are talking about it. Hey, the show in that theater over there, it's going great. <laughs> and their sources. What? <laughs> <laughs> the, the applause can be heard, I assume, out, out in Times Square. And we see a little bit of Hail and Farewell at long last. Uh, Sasha playing a dramatic no, he's killing scene it. on yeah. stage. Yes. <laughs> and, we, and many of those miners' caps. Um, I guess I missed that when I was a kid, because it does fairly well explain mm. what Harpo has on his head. But I didn't catch that when, on early viewings. Um, and then... Uh, we grab the fade out in song, as they say. And it's good. I think it's a very good ending. I think it builds to a, to a nice crescendo. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it, it's very funny when Harpo's body comes out, you know, and then uh, Wagner's shocked by that. And then Davis turns up. And it, I think, you know, I think it's a really nice, very good <laughs> Farsi ending. Um, but then with them all singing together as it fades out. One point to make as well, but when Noah said we see a little bit of the New York street there, um, a point that you made, Noah, I think in an earlier podcast or possibly in your book, I'm not sure which, one or the other. Um, this is this is the third New York Marx Brothers film, isn't it? You know, in Room Service is a movie that I might well have been interested in, even if the Marx Brothers mm -hmm. weren't in it. Um, you know, just an adaptation of a hit Broadway farce of the 30s. Uh, not even that it's a masterpiece, but it's just the kind of thing that I, I enjoy. And I guess the, the previous two, um, you, you, you mentioned this as the third, Matthew, are Animal Crackers, which takes place on Long Island, and Monkey Business, which has that excellent picture of the Manhattan <laughs> skyline. <laughs> uh, but it's true. The, the New Yorkiness of this is, for me, one of its saving graces. So just so I'm clear, how does the plot resolve well, that is a question. I certainly know a question when I see one. <laughs> I, I guess the I guess the plot is resolved by the success of the show. That that means that they're going to have uh, money rolling in and they'll be able to pay their bills and everything. Which makes it even more ridiculous that Wagner isn't doing everything in his power to help get this show going. I mean, it's it's his company. It's the hotel he's working for. They he wants them to make money. Yeah, you know, and they sold all these tickets in advance. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't sell all those tickets that day, did they? Yeah, they yeah. must. Those, those tickets have been selling for a while. 
Yeah, I guess it's just the strength of Gordon Miller's name. I mean, no one's ever heard of Leo Davis. We know that. And uh, apparently the waiter from the hotel is is the principal uh, breakout star of this show, who who was only cast in it like a week ago. And Faker is just a, a performer in the, sh- in the show with no lines? Is he? I mean, I, is he? I, I'm not clear on that. It's a little bit of a, a a variation on the climax of a night at the opera. Like Harpo is in the show here, but he's supposed to be. Yeah, I mean, it would make sense as a joke if he really was dead, wouldn't it? If it if it was like, or and, and... <laughs> you know, that's... wow, much better. When they take out the bowels and he just doesn't get up, yeah. But, you know, but that's what they did with the corpse. You know, they stuck him in the play in this bit where a body is yeah. taken out. But the fact, but the fact that he is just pretending to be dead, and yet somehow has still inveigled himself into that position, is actually uh, quite quite Marxian, I think. Well, it just seems like it's a big dramatic moment that this character has died. So maybe he was one of the stars of the show. Uh, yes, he's what is he says a, a fallen comrade or something. He says, doesn't he? So it's it's some character that has obviously died. I don't know. I mean, what do we think this story is about? I, I get the feeling from the guy with the top hat that it's something to do with, like, strike breaking. I don't know yeah, why. Is like that... an Odette's, a Clifford Odette's kind of play. Yeah. So so it looks like, you know, the the, the Harpo character, if you will, um, has, has been killed during some sort of, some sort of uh, industrial unrest. <laughs> That's my guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. This is called a deep dive in the room service. Yeah. <laughs> It, it seems like he, Faker couldn't be a member of the cast because they never talk about how he should be at the theater, but he's up in the hotel. With yeah. Him. Leo does say that uh, Wagner's gone backstage to get Faker, so he must have been involved in the show in some way. Maybe he's just backstage trying on people's costumes and getting beaten up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I get the feeling that he is he's standing in for that for the body that should come out, but for you know, for no good yeah. reason other than to spook Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because there's no longer any need to hide him, and if yeah. there was, that's a strange place to do it. Exactly. Yeah. And Leo felt that was a good time to reveal that he wasn't dead. <laughs> right. Author, author. <laughs> <laughs> And he says it, it's going going great guns, isn't it, Mister Wagner? As if he had had no idea at all that his doing that would be in any way disturbing to Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's the film itself. Um, one thing that surprises me about the reviews of the movie from 1938 is how savvy they are in identifying what was going on here with room service. Um, the uh, New York Times review says this. On the stage, room service had the advantage of seeming possible. The producing trio did the most incredible things, but did them out of desperation. With the Marx Brothers, absurdities seem always to be wooed for their own Mm -hmm. sake. And that is a weakness of the picture. It does, however, offer compensation by accenting the comic qualities of the presumably non-burlesque characters. Donald McBride's frantic hotel man who takes events seriously is heaps funnier than Harpo Marx, who does not. Frank Albertson's young playwright is more laughable in his puzzled sincerity than Groucho Marx in his studied insincerity. Mm. That's very astute. I don't know if you'd go that far to say they're funnier, but um, that's really true. Um, Here's the New York Daily Worker, 1938. Room service is essentially a success story, and it fits the Marxes a little stiffly because their success has always laid in laughing at success. The one thing that keeps getting overlooked is that when this was coming out, the fact that the room service was now going to be a major motion picture was just as much a news story, probably more than the Marx Brothers have a new film coming out. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and it's, um, I think, we think of room service mainly for its association with the Marx Brothers. But in 1938, the play was very much a known quantity, certainly to the New York press. Um, but uh, more than a year on Broadway, uh, a, a lot of people had a chance to see it. And Broadway was mainstream popular culture at the time. And um, that's a really good point. Room service had um, its own marquee value at the time. I mean, it's certainly been the custom since opera now for for uh, the Marx Brothers films to end with a triumph 
it, the, 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 the they have helped to bring about whether it's um you know um alan jones's triumph in on stage or the the the, the horse race mm. uh sun up winning so it's it is it is in an established tradition that it that, that it would end with them bringing about some form of 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 triumph so it's not it's not as decisive a break as as that review would imply i don't think anymore it would have been if it had come straight after duck soup the whole the whole yeah. premise of the film though wasn't necessarily is the f- play going to be a hit it's like are they going to be able to be able to stay in the hotel room till the uh, play opens yeah exactly yeah then they're, they're not really that the, the only person who really cares about the play is davis isn't it so it's a nice it's a nice sweet little victory for davis mm. but uh you know groucho groucho doesn't care really or doesn't seem to as long as he could pay his hotel bill and get out of there yeah, mm, yeah. that's right yeah. yeah uh the staged version of room service uh, as noted earlier by matthew does not feature this um excerpt from Hail and farewell, or Godspeed. Um, it the the stage version ends uh, with the show has been a success, um, but we stay in the hotel room, um, and Miller is using uh, the success of the show as um, by the transitive law making the hotel a success. He talks about a white way waiter starring in a white way play in a white way theater written by a white way author. And he closes the show right before the curtain falls by predicting that this will be the first hotel to win the Pulitzer Prize. (laughs) Well, room service could have been the beginning of a new direction for the Marx Brothers, but instead it sent them running right back to where they had been, um, but in a much lesser version of their old selves. If there's any compelling argument for pursuing the original concept of this film, I think At the Circus and Go West may be that argument. What if it had been a huge, huge hit? And they were like, Boy, why are we going back to do At the Circus? Well, we should be doing more of this. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing. The, the pity is that they signed on for, for At the Circus before they'd even started shooting this. So it's just, you know, something went wrong. Um, I, I quote Chico in 1939, uh, in my book, he says, um, it was the first time we tried doing a play we hadn't created ourselves, and we were no good. We can't do that. We've got to originate the characters and the situations ourselves. Then we can do them. Then they're us. If we get a gag that suits our characters, we can work it out and make it ours. But we can't do gags or play characters that, are, that aren't ours. We tried it, and we'll never do it again. Yeah, it makes me wish they really had tried it. Mm. Yeah, you want to you want to say no? You didn't try it. You you yeah, should have done, quite. but you didn't. Yeah. You either jump in or you don't. You can't go halfway. Mm. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. I think if they had gone, if after room service they had gone on to make a bunch of classic, great first-rate Marx Brothers movies, then we would say, well, all right, room service, interesting mm. experimental misfire. But the fact that they didn't gives room service this kind of haunted, unfulfilled promise that. Mm is uh you know it has a different quality to it they they the closest they ever got after this to making a great marx brothers movie uh i think we would all agree was night in casablanca mm-hmm. yes i think so yeah mm-hmm. i mean i i prefer this as i say yeah, but I that's already to, uh, uh, almost a decade later to the next the next three mgms i think this is better than in every way including as a marx brothers film um, however compromised it is as a Marx Brothers film, I still think it's less compromised as a Marx Brothers mm. film than, than the three that follow it. Uh, it's, as I say, it's not, it's not a huge favorite of mine, but I, I do prefer it in every way to the three that follow. Now, we should say here, we should be honest, that for a lot of hardcore Marx fans, which we have in the Marx Brothers console, a lot of them really despise this film. Mm. You know, a lot of them put it at the bottom of their list, you know, is, is their least uh, favorite. Particularly, um, I, I don't know if I'm, my pronunciation is right, but Mikael Ullin of Marxology. Yes, Ullin, I believe. Ullin. Um, uh, he's, he's, he has taught me how to say his name, and I still don't. <laughs> I, I believe Mikael Ullin is the closest Aline. I've ever gotten. But he is he's a very anti-room service. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can kind of see why. For me, as a viewing experience, it's just not as unpleasant as some of the other later films. Um, but, you know, I mean, if your problem with it is that it's not a Marx Brothers movie, uh, okay, we'll grant that. I, I mm. kind of like your um, take, Bob, when uh, the three of us were doing our film rankings, which you can find uh, listeners at MarxBrothersCouncilPodcast.com. Uh, each of the three of us has done our list of 
of the Marx Brothers films in order of favorites. And Bob has a footnote on his list saying he'd rather not include Room Service or Love Happy here because uh, they shouldn't be compared to the others because there was no intention here to make a Marx Brothers movie. I th- I agree, Bob. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I-, I guess I've opened up the curiosity now about how did Bob uh, rank <laughs> Room Service and Love Happy, even with that disclaimer. Uh, you know, it's hard. For, it's uh, it's always evolving. I enjoyed Room Service in this last viewing. You know, much more than I did when I viewed uh, the Big Store a few months ago. And I can't necessarily say it's a better film or a funnier film, but I think I enjoyed the experience of watching it more. I guess it just depends what mood you're in. You got your top tier Marx Brothers films. You might your favorite might change depending on what year it is or what mood you're in. And then you have your ones that aren't top tier, and those could fluctuate as well. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. For the curious uh, on those lists, Matthew ranks Room Service ninth, Bob ranks it thirteenth, and I rank it tenth. And I'm changing that because, like I said, I hadn't seen the film in decades the whole thing i just seen i put on little clips on youtube or whatever to look up something to look at a particular scene i'm going this isn't very entertaining but it works better as a whole than it does in pieces most other films you could grab a a scene or a few lines and say oh this is great you can't do that from room service where do i where do i put races do i have races eight um you have races yes number eight yeah but but perhaps this and room service uh, joint eighth well, I don't care how big a joint you have. Room service does not get ranked with a day at the races. Uh, for me, I, I, in, on my list, it comes. Uh, it's I have it as not quite as good as the big store, but better than at the circus. Go west and love happy. Mm. Um, it is interesting in in preparing to discuss this one. You know, it's much more of a plot recap than our mm-hmm. other discussions of their films because. This being a traditional farce, the plot actually is what's important here. Yeah, we weren't going through this quoting grouch lines or gags. There really aren't a whole lot. Yeah. Yes, essentially, because the others obviously all do have plots, but the Marx Brothers aren't anything to do with them. You know, there is there is a plot in Day at the Races about a about a sanitarium, I and mean, there's a plot in and you know, but but it's irrelevant to to what you come for. Hey, there's a whole lot of relevance in At the Circus. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting punchy here. <laughs> and stuffy and wacky. Punchy, that's, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> Bob, there's another nice one of your, I know you like to to spot uh, mm. wig color references. Oh, yeah. Uh, Wagner says, but his hair wasn't red earlier or this morning <laughs> or something. So there's more more indication of that the wig is, is red, not blonde. I'll submit that. Right, or that we are supposed to, believe that the hair is red mm. regardless of what the color of the wig on the set might have been and i'm of the school now that it was a lighter red at this point i can't think of any other reason why they would keep scripting references to it to it being so if it wasn't mm-hmm. i feel there were various wigs over the years i mean we have seen color photos of a unquestionably blonde wig oh this is true yes yes it's true but but at i think least in, sometimes in the films i think i i think he switched to a lighter red is my feed. I, like yeah, that. I think I've mentioned this before that there are a few articles of reporters on set and they talk about Harpo's red wig. Right. right. I wish he'd kept his coconuts one, the, the, the one that, that horror of horrors photographed black. You know, we, they had to change it yeah. because, because it photographed black. You think, oh my God. You know, <laughs> it looks brilliant. I love that coconut. <laughs> What's wrong with it photographing black? I agree. Black? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And, um, the, the uh, and yet um, night in Casablanca when you see him as a platinum blonde, mm. it makes you long for the for that lovely black just normal one. angelic yeah. curls. <laughs> yes. And this was Groucho's last uh, film before they slapped a toupee on him. I, I saw no problem with this hairline yes. here that needed to be corrected. Yeah, it's it's true that Groucho's performance is is quite credible. It's just like so much else about this movie. It's caught between two different approaches that it doesn't always gracefully, it doesn't always gracefully ride that. Um, But he's quite good. I mean, it makes me uh, extra regretful that I, that we can't see him in 20th century Mm. or just tackling a straightforward comic Mm. role. He had the chops for it unquestionably. Mm. I wondered while watching it if maybe if it would be interesting to just listen to room service, think of it as a radio. We're thinking play. the same thing, yeah. And yeah, 
and, mm. and see what how Groucho's performance comes across then, and maybe Chico's too to some extent. The thing that struck me today for the first time when I when I rewatched it was it, it it's almost like what you would imagine a Marx Brothers film to be like if they had been reteamed around say 1955, if they'd been brought mm. back as a team in a movie then and were given this property. Um, it, it's it feels more like something from that era. It feels like the sort of thing you might see on American television. Sitka. It's got a sitcom feel to it, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Situation comedy. It is a situation comedy. And it, I just think, you know, if, if somebody had had managed to lure them, the three of them back to do a kind of a, an ostensibly traditional film again around about 1955, I wonder if it might not be very much like Room Service. And as Noah mentioned earlier, if ever the Marxes needed to tour and refine a show, this was it. This needed the work. Uh, or at least just put it in a theater and run it for a month or so. Come on. It's interesting, isn't it, that some people, I believe I'm correct in saying, have have restaged the play uh, with the Marx Brothers, you know, playing the Marx Brothers, playing the characters. Uh, it's it's almost become a kind of a coconuts and animal crackers that you can you can revive on stage for them. The actual the actual original play itself. You know, uh, it was very successfully revived off Broadway in 2006. Um, there was a production that opened at the Bank Street Theater and then moved to the Soho Playhouse. It had a long run. It was very well reviewed. It was received as, you know, an expert rendition of a charming farce from the thirties. Um, the three leads were Fred Berman, Dale Carmen and Sterling Coyne. They did not play the Marx Brothers. Uh, but you know, if you're a role like Gordon Miller and many such roles in, in these kinds of plays of the time, you know, it's also kind of hard not to play that kind of part without a little bit mm -hmm. of Groucho. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been cast in roles that were not Groucho, but if you look for it, you can still see me occasionally putting a little <laughs> Groucho spin on a line. Because if you're playing a period New York wise guy, you know, how could it not be Groucho? Um there's there's more similarity than it seems between Groucho and, and people like Zero Mostel and Walter Matthau, who we think of as actors rather than comedians. One of our council members, Hal Erickson, was in a, a production recently in which he played Wagner. And um, I kept badgering him to try and get him to, to, to do kind of little subtle hints, like having uh, having a bulb horn on the table and, and, and just <laughs> little little sly little Marxian references. Unfortunately, I think he said the director would, would never go for it, but uh, I think that would have been nice. Is there any word of how the, uh, the original playwrights reacted to the film? Did they care for it? Oh, good question. I don't know. I expect they liked the, the check. I would imagine, I mean, if I had to guess, I would say they were probably delighted, uh, yeah, with the check and with the high-profile Hollywood adaptation. I wouldn't be surprised if they admired the Marx Brothers, but they must have been aware that this was not the ideal mm. adaptation of their work. I have one more question here. Are there really people who like this film so much that they're going to listen to us talk about it for two hours? <laughs> <laughs> Not just any people. <laughs> but this is a good point. We brought this up earlier that, you know, people, when we asked people what films we wanted to, us to talk about, there was, you know, talking about Duck Soup, talk about Horse Feathers. Well, mm. I mean, I could talk about uh, Room Service three times as long as I could talk about Horse Feathers. You know, there's so mm. much more to talk about. Room Service and Love Happy were the two I enjoyed working on most in, in the book by far. Because the story behind the film is so mm. interesting and so um, little told, uh, the genesis of lots of the others is is legend. Joe, we love you, but you gave it, what, three pages in your book? Yes. Uh, Which he Adamson regrets. And considers so, Room yeah. Service the intermission. <laughs> yeah. He, he, it's he, the intermission in their career. He told me that that will, will, will not stay that way in, if, he, if he does another edition. But uh, yeah. Please, Joe, please, another edition. Uh, you know, there are two uh, wonderful lines in, in Joe's chapter about room service. I love his um, deconstruction or his debunking of the idea that, as he puts it, good is a measurable quantity, that if you take a good script and give it to good performers and put it in the hands of a good director, the results will be good. Uh, that it's more complicated than that is a wonderful observation. I also love the way he says, Gordon Miller, who sincerely cares about the fate of his production and the people involved in it, is being played by Groucho Marx, who sincerely cares about nothing at all. Okay, I'm not sure this is going to make any sense, but I'll try it. 
I see this as not the Marx Brothers comedy team starting room service, but more like RKO hired Rufus T. Firefly, Ravelli, and Pinky to act in the film. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like those characters were were hired to be in the in the play to do the play. <laughs> does that make any sense? It so does. Funny. Yes. <laughs> And this is an interesting further wrinkle in the sort of identity crisis of, is Groucho a performer? Is Groucho a character being played by a performer named Julius? Uh, Matthew explores that in his Groucho book. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good point. It's like their characters are playing these characters. Now, do we have time to talk about the colorized version? (laughs) <laughs> well, friends, the Marx Brothers Council podcast is produced and hosted by Matthew Conium, Bob Gassell, and Noah Diamond, and edited by Bob Gassell. Please join us on Facebook in the Marx Brothers Council group, the Internet's brightest and wittiest 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week Marx Brothers party, and probably the biggest such party that will occur until all council members descend on Matthew's room at the oh, Hotel yes. Edison yes. next year. <laughs> we'll try and get something together. Yeah, we're going to try and figure out what to do with this. Something will happen. Uh, one way or another, Matthew will wake up in the middle of the night and we will all be in bed with him. <laughs> um, you can find us, uh, in addition to on Facebook in the Marx Brothers Council group, you can find Matthew at marxcouncil.blogspot.com. You can find me at noahdiamond.com. And you can usually find Bob Gasell at the Hotel Metropole. (laughs) And, of course, you don't need us to tell you that this episode will end with this musical selection. Going great guns, isn't it, Mr. Wagner?